Hey, students. It's great to be with you all. My name is Pava Munkinen. I teach at UCLA, which is located on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Gabrielino and Tongva peoples. I'm excited to team up with Dr. Minji Kim this week to talk about reform efforts and other approaches to fighting against exclusionary zoning, mostly focusing on state level efforts uh, starting in 1969. Uh, you might wonder why the focus on states and why we think of a contemporary period of these movements starting in 1969, since it was such a long time ago. Um, well, that's just where most of the action on this front has been over the last 50 years at the state level, even as insufficient as it has been. Um, you know, states constitutions control the police powers from which local zoning is derived. So they are kind of the, the ultimate authority when it comes to land use. And on the other, other hand, I think the political incentives of smaller local governments, especially, but most local governments will never really work in a widespread way to overcome uh, exclusionary zoning practices. You know, we'll talk about a few places where this is happening. Uh, we'll have heard of Minneapolis, uh, Berkeley, California, other cities. We'll, I'll talk about the city of Culver City where I live, working to overturn its own exclusionary zoning practices. But even if this movement grows to dozens or even hundreds of cities across the country, given that there are 20,000-ish municipalities, you know, I don't see it becoming like a major force for change. So really, I think state level is, is an important place to focus. And there are at least two viable models and potentially a third model that I'll talk about today. All right, I thought I'd start with a beautiful picture of a 40B project in Massachusetts. And you'll see why uh, shortly how this project came to be. Um, this project that seems to be very different from the single family homes nearby. And the rendering of a project in Cupertino, California, the famous Valco Mall project that has over 2000 housing units, including I think half of them are going to be affordable in this exclusionary suburb. And why uh, also this is still only a rendering and not a picture of an actual building as in the case of Massachusetts. So I structured the lecture to first give you an overview of the two main approaches to anti-exclusionary policies at the state level, talking about the pros and cons of each approach and some shared challenges that I see in their implementation and sustainability. Those two approaches are the state affordable housing appeals systems. So this is um, the famous one as Massachusetts 40B. And when we think about appeal systems, one way that I think about it is an empowered developer. So these approaches give developers the power to, over, to appeal to the state government and override local zoning. The second approach is often referred to as the plan mandate approach, and I'll use the case of California's housing element law. These approaches focus on plans, right? So the state requires cities to produce housing elements or housing plans that incorporate uh, zoning for affordable housing production. So the focus on the developer on the one hand versus the plan. Now there's another type of state preemption of local zoning that's often targeted uh, at exclusionary zoning practices. And I call this targeted preemption, right? The idea is that on the one hand, there are some approaches that aren't, aren't very plentiful yet, but have been proposed that target specific geographies, right? So the case of SB 50 in California said, you know, near transit or in areas with a lot of jobs, uh, cities can't block buildings you know, of up to four stories, for example, right? So specific landscapes are targeted for many zoning changes. On the other hand, there are targeted preemptions against specific rules. Um, this is the, the case of ADUs where everywhere there is R1 zoning, localities can't block the construction of a, of a small unit in the backyard. You know, I'll see each of these three, three slash four approaches uh, have pros and cons, I, I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a yes and kind of housing policy, uh, have a housing policy perspective of yes and, you know, and I think we can do elements of all three um, in any state. Okay, so first starting with the appeals, state uh, affordable housing appeals system. This is also called the Northeastern model in this paper by Chris Elmendorf from 2009, which compares kind of the Northeastern versus what he calls the West Coast model. Um, so the, the, this says Northeastern coast, it used to say East Coast, and I changed it to Northeastern, forgot to drop this. Okay, so this exists in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, uh, New Jersey. Um, basically, um, this idea of an empowered de 
developer, what is also called a builder's remedy, where developers for specific projects, certain kinds of developers can appeal to the state to override local zoning and build housing, either that's all affordable or that has 25% uh, or some amount of affordable housing in it. Um, the a builder's remedy will only apply in certain municipalities and you could construct kind of the trigger or, or what allows a developer to use this appeal um, in different ways. Uh, but often it's just those that have less than 10% of their stock as subsidized housing. So if you don't have enough, meaning 10%, then the developers can, can use this trigger. One advantage of this is that the rules are simple, uh, right? So it's 10%, and if you don't have it, then the developer gets to override your local zoning almost entirely, right? So it's simple rules. Uh, you know, that might be criticized as one size, one size fits all. I kind of, I kind of like it though. Um, one of the other pros is that the consequences are clear, right? So develop, and the consequences are clear and connected to actually constructing affordable housing in exclusionary suburbs. So that's why it has been effective. Um, one of the cons, uh, you know, is that the kind of in the long run, this 10% number is probably insufficient. Um, and, so, you know, some of the implementation of it hasn't been perfect. But I think, you know, in general, the builder's remedy is an extremely effective approach. The West Coast model or the plan mandate model exists not just on the West Coast, right? So it's California and Oregon are the most maybe famous cases, but Florida and Minnesota also have versions of this. Um, the idea is that the state requires municipalities to plan for more housing. Uh, this varies a lot um, and how they do it and kind of how much housing they plan for, including affordable housing. Um, they must do this. Uh, you're right, you're right. So, you know, the disadvantage that I see is that it has more local control. Some people might like that. It's not a one size fits all kind of policy, although in California, some uh, cities are saying that currently. Um, you know, the disadvantage of that that I see is that cities are able to, to game the system. And I'll talk about information asymmetry in a little bit. Um, in most cases, this doesn't have to be an element of this approach, but in most cases, the consequences of not doing the sufficient planning are limited or even unclear. Um, you know, one advantage is that over the long run, it, it's a continuous process, right? So you must update your plan periodically and that periodicity, I think, gives it a great advantage. So I think, you know, the Northeastern Coast model has been more effective, I think, on the ground, as I have shown you a picture of a building versus a rendering of a building in California, right? Um, but I think you know the, the planning model, you know, some some merging of the two, I think, might be ultimately the best the best way to do it. Okay, so I'm going to talk through a couple um, challenges implementation that I think will come up in the kind of case studies, right? So you know, it's great to have a, a really fancy law. The right to housing exists in many countries, but if it's not implemented or funded, then it's not going to going to lead to results on the ground. So both of these models require money for public agencies implementing them. They also require political cover, right? So bureaucrats that I know working in, in housing policy, you know, if, if their governor or their agency's director isn't covering their back, right, they, they might be reluctant to enforce law against a very angry constituency or local governments pushing back really hard against them. So, so it's not on its own sufficient. Um, you know, one problem with all of these is that we don't fund affordable housing sufficiently in this country, right? So you can zone, as we'll talk about in the case of California, for a million, you know, cities are, across the state are going to be required to zone for a million uh, low-income housing units. There is grossly insufficient funding for that number of units. I think we have less than 10% of the available funds for that over the next 10 years. Um, so, you know, if there's not enough money to build the housing in exclusionary neighborhoods, it's not going to work. I think one of the disadvantages of the plan mandate approach is that forcing a city to act is hard, right? So cities know much more about their local zoning rules than the state government does. There's this idea of a regulatory hydra, which means that there's there are many ways to block housing from being built, right? So if you, you prohibit cities from having uh, large minimum lot sizes, well, they can impose tons of parking requirements. If you prohibit them from imposing tons of parking requirements, they can impose strict height limits and setbacks and other ways to prevent housing from being feasibly constructed. And so, you know, this game of kind of whack-a-mole um, illustrated by California's ADU legislation um, is a complicating factor for these plan mandates. Blocking action by developers, I think, is not as hard, right? So I mentioned this empowered developer model being more successful, but I think it may be insufficient in many cases, right? So developers have their own set of incentives. 
Um, they often don't want long fights over projects because that means they're losing money. Uh, you know, they might also not want to kind of anger cities in the case of future developments in those cities, right? So they're not, they're not kind of always altruistic forever. Okay, uh, you know, you'll, in all the readings on this topic, you'll see that the, the lack of good uh, consistently collected data on affordable housing production, on different kinds of zoning rules frustrates progress. I mean, especially this has been a lament of housing scholars for decades and decades, right? That, you know, of all these number of municipalities in the country, they each have zoning rules that are quite different. Um, R1 means different things in different places. And, you know, we don't have, the U.S. has a great, as a country compared to other countries that I've worked in, you know, we have a lot of rich data. The census is wonderful. But in this particular area, we need much more data. So it's something Rolf Pendall can tell us a lot more about. He's done a lot of great work on trying to understand the differences in uh, regulatory regimes across the country. And then the final thing is just, you know, expecting continued opposition as programs start working, people will get angry and push back. And, you know, there's, I just wanted to raise this argument. I thought it was a nice paper by, by Nick Morantz on a co-author um, looking at this idea of backfire, because sometimes what you hear in these discussions is, oh, well, if we impose this, you know, this, this anti-exclusionary policy that allows apartments to be built in single family neighborhoods in rich cities, you know, then it'll, they'll impose some worse backlash. Uh, they'll, so this reaction against that will make things worse than they are now, which I don't think is, a, I've never been convinced by that argument, but that's something that, that definitely comes up. And in that paper, they find no evidence of it actually happening. Okay, so starting with Massachusetts 40B, I thought I would show this picture. Um, you know, Massachusetts 40B's Comprehensive Permit and Zoning Appeals Act, which is also known as anti-snob zoning, I think is remarkable in several respects. Um, you know, one thing is the time from which it emerged, right? So it started in 1969. Uh, you know, it's connected to violent fights over school desegregation that happened a bit later, but were based on a law passed in Massachusetts in 1965, the Racial Imbalance Act, which said that within school districts, they were their desegregation was going to be forced uh, through busing um, and, and people were mad about it. What happened in this case was uh, low-income Bostonians, um, because this law was going to affect Boston principally because it was quite large and all the richer white people had fled to the suburbs um, to smaller school districts that were going to be unaffected by this. Um, so the Bostonians were quite mad. The racist Bostonians were mad about integration. Um, and uh, through the legislature imposed this kind of revenge on the suburbs through this anti-snob zoning or anti-exclusionary 40B law. So I'm going to talk a bit about the origins, kind of how it works, its evolution, adaptation to it. And, some ex and one example of a project. This, this section draws on a great reading by Sharon Kreffitz from 2001, as well as work by Nick Morantz at UC Irvine um, and others. So as I mentioned, 1969, it's inspirational. Other states have copied it. And as I, just to reiterate, in municipalities where less than 10% of the stock is subsidized, uh, developers can get this builder's remedy uh, for affordable projects or projects with, uh, with more than 25% affordable units uh, in order to kind of appeal to the state to override local zoning that prevents them from building these projects. It has built a lot of housing. Impressively to me, it has built a lot of housing in those exclusionary suburbs. And I'll compare it to Los Angeles County, where we have a lot of exclusionary suburban cities with zero units of affordable housing. So, you know, Massachusetts was always liberal, but it had a strong tradition of local control. So it's not obvious that this law was going to pass in a place like Massachusetts. Um, you know, the 60s was a big time of urban crisis, riots, uh, uprisings. Uh, you know, the Kerner Commission stating that America's cities were separate and unequal and racial segregation as a root problem in the country. Um, you know, so there were a lot of civil rights activists and advocates working on fair housing, the Fair Housing Act passed in 1968. And so in 1967, these advocates first directed the, the Legislative Research Council of Massachusetts to study this, and people make fun of studies uh, often, rightly, it's a depressing result when you're trying to advocate for a bill, uh, for a law, but, you know, it's often a first step, and it was, in this case, a successful first step because in 1969, uh, they made it happen. It passed by a narrow margin, in part because of this conflict around uh, school desegregation, which led Boston legislators to support 
a law that was going to focus specifically uh, on the exclusionary suburbs. So I've mentioned a bit how it works. Uh, developers have to be qualified, right? And that is, you know, they're a public agency, nonprofit, or, you know, some kind of limited, limited dividend organization. You know, later state programs were developed that would lend to for-profit developers in a certain way that they be, could become qualified in order to do 40B projects. Um, developers, you know, this, this standardization of the application procedure was a side benefit of 40B. Like I said, municipalities often have very different rules, uh, requirements in order to entitle housing projects. And so having one standardized permitting process for the whole state was a very effective tool kind of besides uh, the anti-exclusionary component of this. Also the streamlining of, of timelines, right? So 70 days from when you submit your application, you will get a decision is extremely fast in this, in this business, right? In California, it's often years before a developer knows whether their project can go ahead or not. Obviously, most important uh, impact of 40B is that if, if this local government is imposing conditions that make the project too expensive or infeasible, uh, you can appeal them to the state, which can override the local's decision. So one interesting thing is that what, has, what 40B has produced has changed a lot over the 50 years and it's been in effect, but the statute itself hasn't changed, right? So changes in context and kind of the funding of the agencies, different subsidy programs connected to it, um, and even the housing market itself getting more expensive um, has affected how it's been uh, realized in, in the state, uh, but the statute itself hasn't been modified. I draw attention to that because in contrast to California, California's housing element law has changed kind of almost every year for 50 years. Okay, so over time, you know, another reason that it's, it's, its effects have changed is that, you know, kind of instead of this direct override of local decisions, more of these appeals were decided by negotiation. So the state got better and more at and more interested in kind of working, being a mediator between developers and cities in order to get housing built without kind of a hard override. Um, there's also this kind of uh, diminution of its effectiveness through what are called housing production plans. So municipalities, if they to avoid this trigger of the builder's remedy, if they don't have more than 10% of their housing that's affordable, they can also create their own plan to develop affordable housing in their own terms um, by zoning for land, zoning land for affordable housing. You know, this is one of these things where you're going to start to be suspicious that it's going to be disingenuous. Um, and in fact, I haven't seen research in Massachusetts. But in the case of New Jersey, there's a, a paper finding that municipalities that are more likely to, they're more likely to develop one of these local plans uh, if their housing is more expensive, right? So the exclusionary municipalities say, no, 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 we'll develop a plan on our own to develop affordable housing, but it actually uh, doesn't result in anything, uh, which is often the case in kind of a plan mandate scenario. So it hasn't achieved its ambitious goals, but it's also the most effective uh, program out there. This is a, the result of a paper by Morantz and Zhang recently, you know, so comparing Massachusetts municipalities to counterparts in other states that also have these appeal systems um, in Massachusetts, like a similar income level municipality has more below market interest rate uh, housing units, below market rate housing units than their counterparts. Impressively to me, the kind of dispersion into the suburbs is quite high, right? So looking at the Boston MSA, uh, 50, half, 50, basically half, half, half of the municipalities in the Boston MSA have over 8% of their housing that's affordable, right? So, and, and but only two have 0% that's affordable, right? So between uh, the half that have over 8% and the, and the rest kind of, you know, the range between, you know, a few percent, right? They have some affordable housing in them. And in LA County, what I've found is almost the opposite, right? So there's a large number of cities in LA County, half of the cities in LA County have zero low-income housing tax credit projects, right? Um, 35 cities have one to three, and only 11 cities have like a substantial amount. And, and in fact, the city of LA, that's 40% of the population of the county, has 70% of the, of the low income housing, right? So we have this kind of very persistent exclusion here in, in, in LA County that, that, Mass, that Boston doesn't. I thought I'd show one project, right? So this is a project in uh, Reading, Massachusetts, which is like a commuter rail suburb of Boston, you know, 30 minutes 
by train into downtown. Uh, and this is a, a project that's 68 units in which 17 of them are affordable, right? So this was enabled by 40B and it overrides local zoning. So like setbacks, you'll notice are in height limits and all these things that other normal buildings would have to consider when they're being built, things that make them more expensive to build, as I have discussed in my optional lecture on uh, the impacts of land use regulations, um, don't apply here, right? And so this is something that local residents might be annoyed about, right? So they might wish there were more trees in front of this building, for example. Uh, but, you know, they didn't plan and, and make these kinds of projects happen on their own. And so the state said, you got to let it happen. And it was built in a way that they might have been less satisfied with. Okay, turning to California, I was struck in preparing for this lecture just what the contrast was between California in the late 60s and Massachusetts in the late 60s, right, and 70s. Um, so, you know, California was a conservative state. Uh, and Massachusetts was a liberal state, and the two kind of kind of iconic uh, anti-exclusionary state housing systems were born in a very different manner, right? So the, the Massachusetts one was a civil rights focused anti-snob zoning law in its, in its inception and didn't change much over the decades. In contrast, California's housing element law was sponsored by the Building Industry Association to reduce regulations on the development of sprawling subdivisions, essentially, right? And the, the legislator that carried it was Pete Wilson, who later was the famous governor of the state that tried to impose English only uh, language uh, in the state and was, was much hated by uh, many of the state's progressive uh, residents. Okay, so the basic component of California's plan mandate approach is that jurisdictions, cities and counties uh, are required to periodically update the housing elements of their general plan. So in this housing element, they have to plan to accommodate housing growth by zoning, by showing to the state government that they have sufficient zoned land for new housing that can be built for households of different income levels. And it has changed a lot since it was adopted in 1969. Um, how much housing cities have to plan for has changed. How strictly plans are reviewed has changed and the consequences for not complying. Unfortunately, most of the good changes <laughs> didn't come until 2017. So I think kind of for most of its history has been pretty ineffective, um, but I'm optimistic about the current state and talk about this next week in terms of, in terms of um, actually having an impact. You know, there's a frequent comment, I, you know, I mentioned this kind of contrast between the empowered developer uh, and there's this frequent comment that cities don't build housing, right? Which is true. And so even if they're being forced to plan for housing, they can figure out a way to do so that doesn't actually result in the production of housing. Okay, so drawing from the Bayer article, which is, which is quite good, um, you know, he, he highlights the advantage of the system that it's kind of a sophisticated approach to regional housing planning. Um, it can connect into the wider planning system uh, with regional governments statewide goals in this periodicity of reviews. However, the mind-numbingly intricate, it's mind-numbingly intricate in its exacting top-down procedures mandated in great legislative detail. Um, and you know, in this complexity, it becomes easy to, to game. Uh, motivated cities across the state have great professional planners that have figured out how to not, uh, not allow it to have any housing be built under it, right? So they comply with the law but the housing doesn't get built, unfortunately. So, you know, as I said, the contrast in its origin is stark. Um, the his contrast in its history is, is pretty dramatic, right? So in Massachusetts case, uh, you know, there was impacts from the beginning pretty much of 40B. In California's case, this was a law for 40, however many years before uh, people got really mad about it as they are now because its potential impacts are significant. Um, I, I showed you a rendering of the Valco Mall in Cupertino, which I'll talk about maybe next week, but not until 2017 was there a kind of strict consequence or a visible consequence of not complying with the housing element law in California. In 2017, the bill called SB 35 created something like a builder's remedy uh, in California. So similar to this 40B idea where developers in cities not meeting their targets uh, according to their plan, developers could get could bypass local uh, approvals processes for projects with affordable housing. The big disadvantage with the SB 35 
perhaps we can discuss later is that it doesn't allow developers to override local zoning. So the projects have to be zoning compliant. So it doesn't mean they can build multifamily housing in single family neighborhoods, right? It has to be on parcels zoned for multifamily housing. Okay, so, you know, until 2017, there's a bunch of academic discussion about whether it had an impact to require cities to go through this planning process. I don't think the evidence is, is very conclusive. There's some paper that sh papers that show like, oh, in cities that were compliant, they built more low-income housing, but the problem is those kinds of cities probably were gonna build more low-income housing anyways. So I think it's, it's still not certain whether it had an impact. It definitely produced a lot of plans uh, and jobs for the planners. Okay, so I'm gonna use these kind of phases that Bear outlines in his paper. He has two. I have a third uh, that's like 2017 till now. Um, so the first two from 1967 to 1978, basically the introduction of this uh, housing element law was motivated by the Building Industry Association to reduce regulations to make it easier to build sprawling subdivisions. And, and already from the early years, this idea of all economic segments started to be introduced as other advocates got involved. Um, the problem is localities started ignoring it from the beginning or ignored it from the beginning. Um, over the 70s, kind of the role of the state in this process got more active. Um, so with state oversight of cities housing elements starting to issue guidelines um, and rules about what cities had to include in their housing elements. Um, there were disputes over every step of the way uh, in legislature and in the courts and still most localities ignored it. Um, in, in 1978 or 1977, I think it was, the Housing Community Development Department was assigned the task of overseeing this element. Uh, you know, it, it was interesting because, so there's office, there's always, there, there's also an Office of Planning and Research at the state level that does the general plan guidelines and oversees the general planning process. And so the fact that HCD is overseeing this one element of that, the general plan is, was like a big fight. It's still a big fight today, kind of how, the state uh, oversees these local planning processes is not is not clear. Kind of the right way to do it is not clear. In the late seventies, this idea of non-compliant cities getting sued by the state was introduced. Um, later on, it was removed, and now it's come back. There have been lawsuits, and Newsom's attorney general is is actively pursuing cases. I think to today around housing element uh, law violations. Cities were mad. Cities didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> they still don't. Um, okay, so in 1980, there was a big compromise bill um, that reduced some of the state power to advisory um, and also gave the legislature the responsibility to mandate uh, the details of the process, right? So the, the bureaucracy said, okay, the legislature is going to have to decide all the different rules, which is why there have been so many different laws amending the housing element uh, regulations. And it's the situation that's, that's quite frustrating where the bureaucracy doesn't feel empowered, even though they're the ones that know the most about this process, they don't feel empowered to do a lot of different things that would make it an effective process. Instead, they defer, they say, well, if the legislature doesn't tell us to do it through a new amendment to the government code, then we won't do it, right? And so that's frustrating for advocates. Um, one thing that also happened in the 1980 uh, compromise is that housing elements updates would now be periodic. They started out every five years and now they're every eight years, um, which I think is a is actually a great feature. It should be applied to all plans. I mean, a lot of elements of cities general plans don't get updated for decades and decades, which makes them seem kind of like a waste of waste of time. Okay, so during the 80s and 90s, you know, many different bills and amendments were submitted and passed. Cities started complying more, but the 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 what they were complying with was still pretty vague and still pretty guideliney. And so I don't think there was a big impact. In 2004, two big housing element bills passed. Um, you know, there was a great uh, hearing in which one of the uh, planning director from Long Beach said, the housing element is the most despised required general plan element by local officials. It's the only element that's prepared defensively uh, rather than as a guide to local policy and decision-making, right? So you have this, fight that happens to this date where local governments are saying, ah, oh, you're mandating these things that, that don't actually let us do our job. And, you know, the, the pushback is, well, you know, most cities in LA County have zero affordable housing units. So clearly you're not doing the job on your 
The third phase that Bayer doesn't have in his paper because it's written 10 years before the, the law, the package of laws was passed in 2017, I think is, is really consequential and it's what's guiding um, the current housing element update process. So cities in Southern California are submitting the housing element updates to the state uh, in October, right? So in, in a month uh, is their deadline. Uh, cities in the Bay Area have another year uh, before they have to submit their housing element updates for the sixth cycle, right? So this is happening now um, and it's happening now under rules passed in 2017 that gave cities much higher targets than in previous years, um, actually pushing cities beyond their existing capacity, uh, in, you know, requiring them to do rezonings, which is going to be very interesting to see how they handle that. Um, there's stricter oversight. There's more rules about what sites can be included. Um, you know, whether, whether this is gonna work and lead to housing production, we will see. There's a new requirement around affirmatively furthering fair housing that we'll discuss in detail next week, which I'm very excited about and doing research on, um, and we'll see what happens. Okay, so the final thing I wanted to mention was this idea of targeted preemption by state governments, um, targeting uh, kind of all the zoning rules in a certain geography or targeting one specific kind of rule everywhere in the state. Right, so California's SB 50 was kind of the most dramatic version of the geography uh, kind of preemption, which said, you know, cities cannot prohibit apartments from being built near transit or in high opportunity neighborhoods or where there's a lot of kind of accessibility to jobs. And that didn't pass, but I think kind of this idea of targeting specific areas of a city for upzoning um, from at this from the state's perspective, I think does make sense. You know, there's obviously a lot of issues around that and finding the right areas and adjusting to, to account for gentrification concerns, as in the case of SB50, it did happen eventually. Um, I think it's important, but I think maybe that's one path that hasn't happened much, but has potential. Um, another way to do it is say, okay, in all R1 zones, all single family zones, cities cannot prevent accessory dwelling units from being built, right? And that's happened in California over a long period of time. Um, and now the state is, is doubling down on that by saying in all R1 zones, cities cannot prevent duplexes from being built or lots from being split into the two. Okay, so we're gonna, I think uh, eight, week eight, we'll focus on ADUs. I just wanted to mention briefly uh, California's history because I think it gives a lesson on this kind of challenges of reforms of exclusionary zoning. I think, you know, we've got to try to be excited about ADUs. They're not, they're, they're not, uh, subsidized housing in rich neighborhoods, but they're, I think they're a step in the right direction. And given how little progress I think has been made over the last 50 years, generally on exclusionary zoning, you know, there's something we should be, we should be happy about and, and work, uh, work on. Um, so this is a great paper by Brinig and Garnett, as well as some cool work from Sightline by Dan Berkowitz and Kobobe, um, basically highlighting, you know, took 35 years of state lawmaking to actually materialize in ADU construction. So starting in 1982, the state passed a law that said cities have to allow ADUs. But they said, oh, well, you can have a process that's discretionary where you, you review each project and you can mandate whatever kind of allowances or requirements on those ADUs you want. And as a result, basically none got built. In 2002, this, the, the state said, okay, no, no, no. You have to either amend your zoning to accept them, uh, actually accept them, or we're gonna impose Kind of a state code around ADUs. Um, and this didn't work for a number of reasons, um, but it was kind of brought back 15 years later in 2016, and, and it finally worked, right? So the state law says, if you don't, imp if you don't create your own ADU ordinance that meets a bunch of criteria that, that are feasible, that make the production of ADUs feasible, then you will get uh, the state code. And in the case of Los Angeles, for example, they didn't create their own ordinance in time. They got the state code, and a bunch of ADUs uh, have been built, right? So if you look at um, housing production in the state from 2013 to 2020, this little orange, the growth of the orange at the bottom, you know, in 2020, 13,000 ADUs were permitted uh, across the state. And actually a lot of those, I think 4,000 or so were in the city of LA. Okay, so a quick recap, you know, I talked about these three approaches to zoning preemption by state governments affordable housing appeals systems, which is exemplified by Massachusetts 40B, plan mandates exemplified by California, and these targeted preemptions by state governments. 
you know, I mentioned many challenges. I mentioned the lack of progress on, on, on this topic, uh, you know, partly political commitment, partly money for the bureaucracy to make things work effectively. A lot of it has to do with insufficient funds for, for affordable housing generally. Um, you know, it's not just, it's not enough to just allow it. I've highlighted how I think forcing cities to act seems harder than empowering developers, but empowering developers has its own limitations. Um, the evidence base, unfortunately, is often weak, uh, but you know, you, we, we must sustain efforts because you know, people are gonna oppose it. We'll talk about this, I'm sure, more uh, next week. Uh, people will get mad about changes that, that change their neighborhood, but uh, we need to keep, keep working on it. So thanks for following with me and I look forward to uh, seeing you again next week.